anyone who is either a DCH, DNB or MD in pediatrics or aspirant of DNB or DM neonatology or is actually doing or has completed DNB or DM neonatology has some time or the other encountered neonatal seizures which are being increasingly seen in the neonates. So I decided to make this video on the recent most guidelines of neonatal seizures. These guidelines are actually the recommendations which have been given by the International League Against Epilepsy Task Force in the year 2022. And what I want to stress is that they have come up with two major changes. First is the newer modalities which are coming up in a big way have been recommended. And the other thing is that they have given recommendations on anti-seizure medications. ASM is the short form on anti-seizure medications of choice, of introducing anti-seizure medications and recommendations on withdrawal. So watch the video till the end to know the details about these two things. So why is this video important? The most common neurological emergency as I told you people is neonatal seizures and in neonates a total seizure burden of more than 40 minutes or maximum seizure burden of more than 13 minutes per hour increases the odds of an abnormal long-term neurological outcome by 8 to 9 times. And with the small family norms coming in, the parents are becoming extremely particular about their children. Electrographic seizures, which I shall be discussing in the next scene, they are seen in around 50 to 80 percent of the neonates. The American Clinical Neurophysiology Society has defined electrographic neonatal seizure as an abnormal EEG event which occurs suddenly. It is defined by a repetitive and evolving pattern with a minimum 2 microvolt peak to peak voltage and duration of at least 10 seconds. Now seizures can be of two types. They can either be electroclinical when both EEG abnormality and clinical correlate is present or they can be only electrographic that is when no clinical correlate is present and only EEG changes are there. Also seizures can be classified as motor versus non-motor. Motor includes focal clonic, focal tonic, focal myoclonic and epileptic spasms while non-motor seizures include autonomic and behavioral arrest. So how to diagnose the seizures? Video EEG is the gold standard. But in case video EEG is not available, even amplitude integrated EEG has been shown to have a median sensitivity and specificity of 78 versus 54 percent compared to the fact when no EEG is being used for the diagnosis of seizure. But just in case EEG is any kind of EEG is not available, the diagnostic certainties have been classified as follows. The level one is a definite seizure. It is confirmed on EEG whether or not clinical correlate is present. So this is the gold standard diagnosis of seizures. Level 2 is a probable seizure when either the clinical seizure is a focal clonic or focal tonic seizure or a seizure is present on amplitude integrated EEG. Level 3 is a possible seizure when clinical events suggestive of epileptic seizures other than typical focal clonic or focal tonic seizures are there. Like focal clonic or focal tonic seizures are the norm in newborns, but if they are not present, then other epileptic seizures are there. Then also you can label the patient as having possible seizure. For example, the video which I had shown you in the first scene. If the clinical events do not meet the case definition of a seizure, then it is not classified as seizure. And in case the clinical event assessed by EEG and has been diagnosed, no, has not been diagnosed as seizure, then in that case also you label it as no seizure activity. So the first thing is which newborn seizures, neonatal seizures require anti-seizure medications. So the answer is basically all electrical seizures with or without clinical correlates need to be treated. Clinically apparent seizures should be treated if they last for more than th 3 minutes or are brief serial seizures. At most of the places clinical seizure activity means anti-epileptics are started simply on clinical seizure activity. But now they have clearly defined 
if clinically apparent seizures are lasting for more than 3 minutes or they occur in the form of brief but serial seizures in that case a, a proper anti seizure medication should be started otherwise all electrical seizures whether or not they have clinical correlates should be treated so should we treat these seizures yes all electrical seizures should be treated earlier we knew knew that the preferred first line anti seizure medication in neonates is phenobarbital the recommendation still says stays the same but the strength of evidence is moderate however if the seizures are due to some kind of channelopathy which is evidenced by a positive family history of epilepsy or seizures or is proven by genetic testing in that case a sodium channel blocker should be the first line anti seizure medication so now what are the sodium channel blocking uh, anti epileptic drugs phenytoin and carbamazepine are the classical sodium channel blockers newer drugs like lamotrigine felbamate topiramate oxcarbazepine zonisamide rufinamide lacosamide and eslicarbazepine acetate are also there so i think one must start with phenytoin if it is a proven channelopathy the efficacy of levera which is commonly used for neonatal seizures by many new physicians i have seen it this was lower than phenobarbitone as uh, observed by the ile task force but the incidence of hypotension which occurs frequently with phenobarbitone that was also lower for levera now what is the preferred second line anti seizure medication what we knew earlier was that either benzodiazepine phenytoin or lidocaine is the second line anti seizure medication phenytoin and lidocaine you require cardiac monitoring because they predispose to developing arrhythmias now this guideline says that either phenytoin levera lidocaine or midazolam can be used as second line but in a neonate with cardiac disorder levera should be used because it does not have increased predisposition to arrhythmia now what confusion arose in my mind is that i haven't seen people using lidocaine for treating neonatal seizures but when i looked into the literature i found that lidocaine is used to treat neonatal seizures refractory to other anticonvulsants it is effective but is also associated with cardiac toxicity so in patients with cardiac disorders levera is given and it is known to have a concentration dependent effect at concentrations between 0.5 to 5 microgram per ml it can suppress neuronal excitability but in higher doses it can be a pro seizure medication as well now suppose a patient's a newborn seizure is controlled on anti seizure medications then when should we discontinue it earlier we knew that we must stop anti seizure medication only when neurological examination is normal and or eeg is also normal if the patient is seizure free for more than 72 hours this was the previous recommendation which we had been following in the common practice but now in it says that in acute symptomatic seizures whether or not they are electroclinical or electrographic without evidence for neonatal onset epilepsy anti seizure medication can be discontinued and rather should be discontinued before discharge irrespective of whatever the mri or eeg findings were so why because this was based on the observation of different studies evaluation of different studies from which a conclusion was drawn that there is no difference in risk of developing neurodevelopmental delay or post neonatal epilepsy at 24 months of age with early cessation of anti seizure medication in case the patient had acute symptomatic neonatal seizures also what now one question can come in the mind like as to what is neonatal onset epilepsy so neonatal onset epilepsy or neonatal epilepsy is defined by unprovoked seizures and myoclonic seizures in newborns especially in patients with a positive family history so how to discontinue these anti seizure medications when seizures are controlled if seizure this what we knew till date is that if seizure control is achieved with a single anti seizure medication then that can be withdrawn 
abruptly. But if seizures are controlled on more than one anti-seizure medication, then the medication should be stopped one by one and phenobarbitone should be the last drug to be withdrawn. So gradual tapering has to be done if the patient has seizures controlled on more than one anti-seizure medication. So this time also ILE has not made any change in these guidelines. Is there any role of prophylactic anti-seizure medications in HIE? Like suppose a patient is in HIE stage 1 and you give prophylactic anti-epileptic so that he does not progress to stage 2. I think this is a very common question. Sometimes people in practice, they do ask questions as these. So the answer is clear cut. Earlier also it said that there is no role of any prophylactic anti-seizure medications and now also it does not make any change in the same guidelines. Now coming on to the value of EEG which earlier also I had stressed is very important. What we knew till date is that EEG recommendation was based on the context. Wherever available all clinical seizures confirmed should, be con should have been confirmed by electroencephalography. But this time the ILAE has pointed out, out to a stronger role of EEG in confirming and diagnosing neonatal seizures. It is a must to detect and treat electrical seizures in addition to pure clinical seizures. Is there any role of pyridoxin or pyridoxal 5' phosphate for treatment of neonatal seizures? Yes, in the absence of hypoglycemia, meningitis, hypocalcemia or any other obvious underlying etiology for seizures like HIE, ICH or infarction, pyridoxin treatment may be considered for anti-seizure medication in a specialized sensor center where this treatment is available. This was known, this was the earlier recommendation. But now it says that a trial of pyridoxin should be given on as an should be given as an add on to ASM. While earlier it said should be given before ASM, but now it says as an add on to anti-seizure medication. But in neonates who present with clinical features and EEG characteristics of vitamin B6 dependent epilepsy or in seizures which are unresponsive to second line anti-seizure medication without an identified etiology. So what are these clinical features? These are myoclonic jerks, spasms, abnormal eye movements, gram acing. And what are the EEG characteristics? These are burst suppression and discontinuity. An optimal dose of pyridoxin that prevents seizures is yet to be defined, but in various places the dose has been mentioned ranging from 15 mg per kg per day to up to 100 mg per day. In case of no response to pyridoxin, pyridoxal 5' phosphate may be tried and at least a 3 to 5 day trial is required to identify the, the patients who respond late. And the last recommendation I think is about therapeutic hypothermia. Earlier therapeutic hypothermia was not in clinical use in most of the neonatal centers in 2011. But now also despite it having been come into use at many places, the evidence is still weak of whether or not to use it to reduce the seizure burden in patients with perinatal asphyxia and HIE. And this is because actually the impact of therapeutic hypothermia as a specific seizure therapy has not yet been assessed in large numbers. So a proper recommendation is not cannot be made because strong evidence is not there. So to summarize the key points of these guidelines or recommendations, electrographic seizures are being recognized in a big way. All such seizures should be treated. In places where video EEG or amplitude integrated EEG monitoring facilities are scarce, one may use the levels of diagnostic uncertainty in which only focal clonic or focal tonic seizures have high diagnostic probabilities of true seizures. While starting anti seizure medications, the first line drug is phenobarbitone. Sodium channel blockers can be preferred for a recognized channelopathy. The second line drugs can be phenytoin and levera, especially in patients with cardiac disease, also lidocaine in recommended dosages and midazolam. While stopping anti-seizure medications, 
In acute symptomatic seizures, these drugs can be stopped abruptly before discharge. If seizures are controlled on a single anti-seizure medication, abrupt withdrawal can be done otherwise. And if seizures, I'm not talking about acute symptomatic seizures, I'm talking about a long-term control of seizures here. If the seizures are controlled on more than one anti-seizure medication, then gradual tapering of the anti-seizure medications has to be done and phenobarbitone has to be tapered in the end. There is no role of prophylactic anti-seizure medications in patients with perinatal asphyxia which are stage 1. A trial of pyridoxine is recommended as an add-on to anti-seizure medications when both the clinical and EEG evidence of pyridoxine deficiency is present. There is still weak evidence for therapeutic hypothermia as an anti-seizure therapy. So after summarizing, what are the main implications for practicing neonatology as per these guidelines? Since 40 to 50 percent, rather 50 to 80 percent of electrical seizures are associated with, um, are there which do not have a clinical correlate. Hence, in that case, EEG monitoring in high risk neonates will soon become standard of care in neonatal ICUs and should be promoted in a large way. And as neonatal units become more and more confident in practicing therapeutic hypothermia, more evidence is required to support its role in reduction of seizure burden in neonatal asphyxia. Thank you so very much for a patient watching and listening and please do share the knowledge.